The stock market continues to rally with the NASDAQ putting it its best first six months in decades. Unexpected, but does that actually change anything? Is the most anticipated recession in history not going to come? Was it all overblown? Is everything fine? I think we're going to have a uh, breadth of different opinions today on the show, of course, with Mike McGlone, Dave Weisberger, and special guest Alex Kruger, who may be taking uh, the other side of that to the one that we've been taking on this show for many months in the past. You guys definitely do not want to miss this one. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. Now, today may be, not sure, we're working on it, but maybe my only stream of the week because I'm going to be traveling. I'm headed to uh, London for the, just not, not for bad reasons, I should say, for the British Grand Prix uh, Formula One this weekend. I'm lucky enough that OKX is hosting me to be there. I'm also shooting a commercial with them this week in London. So just going to depend on scheduling, availability, accessibility. Uh, but today's show, I could not be more excited about. Obviously, everybody knows at this point that Macro Monday is my favorite uh, day of the week. I get to sit here and listen and learn from people much smarter than myself, which is generally the goal of the channel. On this channel, I like to bring on smart people so that I can learn, and then hopefully through osmosis, you guys also learn from uh, them teaching me, uh, especially those who are extremely experienced. Also, I should mention Twitter spaces today, uh, 10, 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, just got confirmation that Kyle Davies and Suzu of Three Arrows Capital will be joining and allowing us to ask them basically whatever we want about what has happened in the last year. I'm not sure that they've done an interview together yet, uh, hopefully our team is prepping aggressively for that in the background right now while I'm here. But uh, that is the plan. As we wait for uh, Alex to show up and to go ahead and bring on uh, Mike and Dave. Gentlemen, happy holiday. I appreciate you guys being here today because I know that uh, we're celebrating independence. We do get a half a market day, though, right? So it's not a completely a day off for markets. <laughs> I thought that we were going to have a day off today, actually. I wasn't even sure that markets were going to be open, and then I looked. But they'll be completely completely closed tomorrow. But uh, do you think we'll see anything meaningful today, Mike, or you think that uh, it's going to be slow and yeah. kind of, yeah? We got it all. It was the end of the quarter, end of the first half on Friday. We got it all there. A little bit of pullback in NASDAQ this morning. But today's a, a, non, a nothing day. And I remember a lot of my European colleagues that they love this time of year because they get some work done because those Yanks are gone. So, um, <laughs> I but um, no, it's a nothing day, but it's a good time to catch up. And I, I enjoy, um, I don't know if we want to start out with outlooks or anything, because Dave mentioned when Alex comes out, we're going to have a big bit of a debate. I potentially, completely, potentially want to lose that debate. Because to me, just, just <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I, no, I, no, I want him to be, um, I just like, because I hear he's got these different views, which is great. But sometimes I like to lose debates and let markets decide whether you win or not a year or two from now that to me is what's going to matter well that's the only way that's the funny thing about debates right is that uh, by the time the person one of them is chosen correct everybody's forgotten that the debate even existed it takes a long time well it's less of what if, if we all agree on this bullish narrative for all these risk assets you know what benjamin disraeli says it's one thing about uh, widely expected consensus that usually don't happen. And that was definitely what happened in one age as I was. Most people bearish equities, guilty. Bearish equities, obviously expected a bounce. I didn't expect this much, but now what does it mean is what we're really moving into. And I look at it as, okay, it's keeping the Fed on that tightening uh, mode. It's got everybody bullish and long and cryptos have underperformed. Now, Bitcoin on a risk adjusted basis is basically, it's got a basically a two ba 2x, the risk of the Nasdaq on a volatility, um, you know, two annual volatility basically kept up with the Nasdaq. But if I look at the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, the whole space, with the exception of Bitcoin, it was a poor quarter. If you look at it risk adjusted, you're taking that much extra risk. You better be doing better than the stock market. So I asked myself, that's great to make money. But what happens if this tide goes out in 2Q and, and 2H? So let's look at ourselves by the end of this year. Our Bloomberg, Bloomberg, Bloomberg economics team expects unemployment can be inching higher at 4.3%. Look at that body in motion. It hasn't even changed yet. And expect a mild recession. I just still love that mild recession 
Now, obviously, those of us who've been expecting recessions have been wrong completely, but I fully expect just a normal historical recession reciprocal to the amount of liquidity we pumped and dumped from the system. And also a key thing that's really changing is there's been a lot of extra, extra liquidity from people not having to make their stupid student loan payments. That's off. We've had some major government programs. Those are going to be end, not ending, but curtailed soon as we get to election season. Um, but for me, the bottom line is, yes, maybe we'll get lucky and get that announcement that BlackRock will get that crypto um, that Bitcoin ETF, and then, of course, all the other people like the Winklevoss twins and everybody's been complaining for 10 years will get kind of upset, but we'll go back there. But that's a key thing. That's an if statement. And then I have to look, we have to ask ourselves in cryptos, and this is a sense I got in a year ago in, in crude oil when I looked around and everybody I spoke to was so bullish. And I was called the idiot room. That's, I really appreciate being called the idiot room. I just sense so much bullishness. Um, because the market went up, and if you look at the details of a broad index, it's really trading very poorly versus the equity market, which is going up a lot. Yeah, just for really quick, Dave, for some context, the reason that we kind of came up with this stream today <laughs> with the title was this article in Bloomberg, Stock Market Rally That Shocked Everyone Is Broadening Beyond Tech, right? I pointed out that this is a historic rally of the NASDAQ over the past six months, but then the criticism clearly was, oh, it's all five or six stocks, Right. And now there's some evidence that that is broadening, and it's not just those stocks, which is leading people to be even more bullish. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, hopefully, Alex is ready. I see him in the back, but uh, we're going to we're going to add him to the stream as well. But go ahead, Dave. So the only thing I want to comment on is the 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 argument on Bitcoin beta and uh, and correlation and risk adjustment. Um, the only word I can say to what Mike just said is bullshit. There's uh, no, and I repeat, no stability in the beta of Bitcoin to any of these assets for a very good reason, which I have made many, many times clear. But the data, when you see the beta and the correlation bounce from 100 to negative, you know, not 100, but, you know, go, the, in the high double digits to the low double digits and back and forth within a year, that is a level of instability that predictions are, it's just, it's just, it's random noise. Now, why is it random noise? I've made this point many, many, many times, and I will keep making it. Bitcoin trades like an option on its own long-term adoption, period. It is not trading like an asset because Bitcoin is every single Bitcoiner, well, not everyone, but the 80 some odd percent of hodlers that are holding Bitcoin for a very long time at an all time high are doing so because they believe Bitcoin will demonetize gold and beyond. Now, a little bit of financial history again, just to, just to make the point clear, is gold's market cap is right now, today, unlike 1971, represents about 10%, maybe 8% of total monetary aggregates in the world. And it's a double digit trillion market cap. Uh, before, you know, if you go back 50 years before that or 100 years before that, gold and silver more or less shared the monetary aggregates. They were at 100%. Gold eventually demonetized silver. Silver no longer trades monetarily. Metals like platinum, which are equally useful industrially, actually more so, and equally useful in jewelry, actually more so, uh, and are much scarcer in the Earth's crust, are worth a lot less. So the argument on Bitcoin, and it's, it's clearly an argument, the market is pricing it at around 4% probability of it becoming digital gold. But actually, there are people in the Bitcoin community who believe it will go well beyond that. And the fact of the matter is, when you're talking about a 20x potential rise versus a fall into obscurity or irrelevance that makes correlation with risk assets coincidental during periods of time now the reason that you see high spikes in correlation is for a very simple one and that is it's a very speculative asset it's an option after all and the human beings that are doing speculation uh, are the same ones that are speculating on risk assets and so when there's a massive event they have no choice and so it becomes the first thing to be sold when there's one of these macro events. But when we're not having it on the downside for a macro event, uh, that correlation evaporates and it actually goes the other way. So I I'm tired of, of hearing the argument that when the market sells off, Bitcoin will get crushed, but Bitcoin will never have outperformance to the upside because I think that's wrong. I think Bitcoin trades based on its own factors. And we could talk about that, but because Alex is here and he's written yeah, so much. Let's talk, we, yeah, we got to go into I the matter here talk. because yeah, no, we, we no, have no, varied no. opinions. And hey, uh, I, I think by this uh, Monday, after all the months, I think we know where all the three of us stand on Bitcoin and its correlation or non-correlation and where that's going to head in the future. But Alex, obviously you can see the title here. We're economists wrong. 
The economy is not collapsing. There's been consensus that a recession is coming, and it seems to never come. Uh, the stocks just had a historic six months. So where do you stand in general on where the economy is, where the stock market is, and where it's heading? Morning, guys. Uh, sorry Morning. for being late. Um, no, you're good. Um, well, I, I've been bullish all year, uh, rather openly. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm going to basically squeeze the bull by, by the balls. Um, uh, the trend is up, and uh, the trend is your friend. So there's actually there's many reasons for uh, stocks going going up the way they've been going up. There's, there's particularly three reasons that uh, simply make sense, and uh, uh, one of them was clear from the very very beginning. The other one emerged as the year went through, and the third one just hit us in the face with ChatGPT and uh, generative AI, basically, and Nvidia earnings uh, literally blowing up to the upside and and and. Just, just changing the market. Uh, the first one is the Fed. The Fed being basically done by at least ninety percent. Maybe it's the way to think about it is uh, uh, the Fed uh, right, uh, last year in twenty twenty two delivered the, its uh, fastest tightening cycle in history uh, by by a very large margin. Delivered twenty in total so far. We've had uh, twenty hikes. So the way to think about it is by the end of this year we. We will likely have, if we, we believe the, the, the Fed, the FOMC, which I think we should, uh, we will likely have 22 hikes uh, of uh, 25 basis points. And uh, if you think about it, uh, that will put the total number of hikes at 22. So if we have 20 hikes so far in, which is what we have, so five and a quarter percent uh, versus uh, 25 basis points, at which point we started. That's... 20 hikes by the end of the year we're going to have 22 that's basically 90 percent done so the way to think about it is very simple what difference does it make if the fed ends up being hawkish and instead of being 22 hikes we get 23 or whoa 24 well the answer is not that much so that's the first point that actually was 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 clear from january 1st uh, the second one is the fact that that the economy actually has been doing very well, has been resilient. The U.S. economy, not 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 Europe, not China, but the U.S. economy has been beating expectations very consistently all throughout the year. And this, uh, although it emerged this this fact, it was uh, rather also kind of predictable. And uh, I do want to say it's like I I, I I've been talking about this. Uh, uh, since uh, end of last year, and um, it's the fact that basically when when we have what's been literally the most widely predicted recession in history, what happens is economic factors front run this. They start adjusting their forecasts down. Everybody gets bearish, and then afterwards, when the time comes, beating expectations becomes rather easy. That's what happened. Um, so th those are the three variables to, to, if you have to think about it, is again, is, is uh, AI, the Fed being almost done, and uh, growth in the U.S., and, and, and once again, the U.S. alone beating expectations considerably all throughout the year. Mike? Um, well, thanks. Those are known knowns. We appreciate that, Alex. And number one, congratulations for getting it right. It's the next six months that matter. And I get that about um, recession. But here's a key thing I want to ask you about is the market went up. Did it go up? Are you expect it to go up because it went up? Um, that's what I love my favorite technical analysis. I remember dealing that with customers a lot. So it broke through resistance. It's going to go higher. The key reason I think it might have gone up, most markets went up, is because it went down. That is the main reason the, the crude oil market went down. And that's the main reason I think it's going to keep going down. But here's the issue is we are trying to predict with most of us maybe have in front of me the terminal. I have minimum but standard 50 years of data trying to predict 100 year the aftermath of 100 years events with 50 years of data. So I last few weekends I went back to <laughs> us to an, a, analyze most of the crises over history. Main ones in this country is the panic of 1907 and then 1930. I didn't say 29, I said 1930, because I compare this year to 1930. Stock market went up 50% from the bottom, and the rest is history. So for me, the bottom line is 
we are still in the midst of the Fed tightening. So if you look at Fed rate height expectations, they're still probably not going to peak until five. We just pulled it up until um, five point um, four percent in November, and right now the five point oh eight, the effective rate. So there's still a lot more hikes in the system. And the key thing that I like to ask is. We have such a lagging, the Fed watches such lagging measures of inflation, personal consumption, expenditures, employment costs, and they just, they've been stuck at 4 to 5% ever. But you look at the trajectory, they're starting to head lower, Fed funds still heading higher. So you have to expect all the lessons of liquidity not to matter for us not to have a recession and for us not to have a decent correction in the stock market. So now let's, let's tilt that over to, to cryptos. I like to point out the fastest horse in the race, cryptos, have had an okay quarter. They went up about the same. The Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index went up more than the um, NASDAQ. It should because it trades at basically a much higher volatility, but it's showing divergent weakness. Now, we're all getting bullish Bitcoin because we're supposed to get that ETF in the U.S. That's still an if statement. So I look at it going towards, let's say, by the next six months. First, so I hope you're right. I firmly hope you're right that we're going to get this continued. Oh, we're not going to have a recession. Everything's fine. Fed can keep tightening. And the biggest pump in liquidity that's dumping is not going to matter. To me, it's the delayed reaction. Then the numbers I'm seeing are specific. And this is one thing I did expect is the market to get all excited because inflation is dropping rapidly. But that's what happens in depressions and recessions. So right now, the producer price index is negative. The finished goods index it's a year over year index it's and it's dropping it's the fastest pace in history yes my data only goes back to 1948 it was really hard for me to compare how fast that dropped in 1930 but to me that's the macro i'm pointing out and i'm really happy to be considered wrong by the end this end this year for being mick gloom by pointing out these facts and then we have to be i'll end with this we have to be very careful pointing out that market's going to go up because it went up now we're at the stage it might go down because it went up now i get ai i mean remember i was trading when we had the internet bubble i was trading when we had all those fuel cell stocks i remember they're great um but the key thing for next half the second half of this year is the way i look at cryptos narrow down those cryptos if we don't get a higher plateau from the stock market, that to me is the domino factor that's extremely negative for everything. Meaning the Fed will have tightened. Those, those tightenings that have kicked in are still priced in and will be in for a while. They're not going to be easing like they have in the past. It's, it'll start tilting lower and then there'll be nothing to save us. Like you've probably been trading for 20 years or so, I'm guessing. And everything, single time the market went down, the Fed saved you. That's changed. So I'll pass it back to you. And again, I do hope I, do, I, I hope you win this debate today. To me, it's really what happens to markets by the end of this year. And I'm, this is the most concerned I've ever been in my 35 years of being in the business about what can happen. And I compare it to 1930. So massive bull trap, basically. I think so. Yep. And, and bottom line is don't fight the Fed. The Fed's still tightening. Got another 30 basis points still priced in the market, and they're going to keep doing it. I think they're at the mode now. They're going to keep tightening until the market tells them not to, the stock market. That's the, 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 pri- the, the pricing in aspect of it is so laughable to me. Uh, you're correct. Uh, it's just it changes so dramatically on the whim of a individual Fed speaker. And, I mean, there's been times of this year when we were pricing in you know, uh, five cuts, right, by the end of the year. And then uh, one statement from Powell, and all of a sudden, no cuts by the end of the year, or a 70% chance tomorrow, then it becomes a 30% chance. So I find it hard to utilize anyone's predictions as to what's going to happen. But but I think it the only facts we have is that they keep saying they're going to tighten. So I, I the market I, doesn't I, seem to want to listen to them. I, I have uh, Powell to literally every meeting says, we're going to tighten, we're going to tighten, I, we're going to tighten. I, I, I have the, the thing about um, predicting something that's really never happened in everybody's lifetimes is you have to take that risk of going through these little nuances. And I think we're in that. And I'm willing to take that risk that, yes, this is a very unusual thing for someone like me in my position to point out. But I see it every day. I see all these indications. I mean, then we have to ask yourself, why did the, the smartest people in Wall Street completely miss the collapse in commodities this year? Because they're missing the, what's happening geopolitically in, in China. They're, China's tilting over to me the similar. I mean, I saw we all some of us saw the Soviet Union collapse and Japan collapse. I was trading equities in the 90s when that happened. It's just, these things are macro hundred year cycles that are kicking in the way I see it. And the U.S. I, I published this morning the the Dow Jones Industrial Index divided by GDP 
in 20, at the end of 21, right before the Fed started tightening in 22, versus GDP was the highest since 1937. So yeah, equities were expensive and still are historically versus everything. And to me, this is that great reset that hasn't even started. But the key thing was the leader of all this were cryptos, 25,000 of them. And the point that they're still, that, yeah, they're bouncing, but we see what's happening. There's only one that's a star on an if statement. And the rest are like, yeah, there's 25,000 of them. I'm long from way here. And I'm hoping someone will save me. And the Fed's not going to do that. Well, the way I see it, basically what's going to happen is positioning is what's going to save us because everybody's been so bearish. And uh, a lot of very smart people with a lot of money being bearish all year and they're not positioned, especially on crypto. We go into, into crypto and Bitcoin. They're most definitely not positioned uh, from what I gather, most people on, on average exposure of smart money is under 60% uh, in a bull market. That will be 100. So what's happening is we have Bitcoin. We have very strong news of uh, black of the BlackRock ETF, uh, the, the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF uh, likely being approved. It's debatable if it's going to be approved or not. The probability is debatable. The, the point is right now we just moved 20% on this news. And the probability is definitely, in, it's an opinion, but definitely about 50, about 50%, uh, if, if not around 75%. So the point is the market on one hand, market is not positioned right for this. That's the first point. The second point is the news are huge and not properly priced in yet. Or on a technical basis, we're right at the edge of resistance. We basically what is called an air pocket right above between 31k to 37k 37k being the luna level from may whatever may 18th or you know that fatidic weekend where most of us uh had almost a heart attack and some of us basically went out and, and danced and joy as their their well anyway uh um that's that's basically the point in bitcoin we're right at the edge of a breakout and once it breaks it should keep on running uh, I, I do want to say on the correlation side, there was uh, uh, the regulators in the U.S. got very aggressive this year, starting early April. Uh, many large market makers started taking a step outside of the market. That made correlations break down uh, to basically back to 2020 levels before uh, Bitcoin was a macro asset. That is temporary. I think I want to stress that is temporary. This is very important correlations with risk assets going to come back up, especially if we get that ETF. We're going to get all these new market makers. They're going to make Bitcoin start trending, trading just like it was before. So yeah, risk assets, if you're looking at Bitcoin, risk assets pretty soon going to start mattering, mattering once again a lot. So the correlations will return. It's interesting. Go ahead, Dave, please. I was just going to make one point. I mean, I think that it's important to have two discussions, right? You know, the the the, the Main Street macro uh, discussion is extremely important, and Mike's thesis, which I think is true, at least in one to one one for sure, and I've been agreeing with him for six months, which is the Fed will keep acting until the stock market forces them not to, or I add to that the presidential race has started in earnest and they're going to back the hell off because they don't want to be accused of electing one candidate or the other. Uh, but I do think on the Bitcoin thing, it's extra Bitcoin side. It's extremely important to understand that we're that, that what happened last week in and of itself should be propelling Bitcoin significantly higher. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that there's all these macro factors Keep in mind, we've had a, a, whether or not BlackRock, BlackRock or Fidelity gets approved. What is incredibly important about the news from last week is two of the top four asset managers in the world have both declared their support for Bitcoin as an asset class. It's no longer uh, fake in magic Internet money. And when that happens, that is probably the single biggest news we have toward probability of long-term adoption that we've had over the last you know, year and a half, certainly since Luna blew up. And 20% in Bitcoin is, is minuscule. If you do a three-year chart of the Bitcoin hash rate versus price, you see one of the most obvious stat arm plays in the history of stat arm plays. I mean, literally, it's, it's, you can pull it up, Scott. Just do, you know how to do it. 
I mean, you see a monotonically tightly increasing, looks like the S&P from 2009 through 2000 and, you know, whatever, you know, wh whatever through the pandemic, you know, the beginning of the pandemic uh, is the hash rate, the network growth. And you see a double top followed by a fall, followed by what looks like a very obvious, I and mean, I hate inverse head and shoulders. I hate all the magic mumbo jumbo, but a massive dichotomy. Uh, if I ever see a chart like this, I want to be short the top line and long the bottom line. Can you pull it up? I think it's. I was looking. I can't. I, we, where, where do we look at it exactly that we I'll, usually pull it up? Share, I'll share it. Uh, yeah, just share it. Go ahead. Just share your screen. Present right um, below. Guys, we're, we're treading into new territory here. We might see Dave's screen. Crazy. Yeah. So Crazy, I know. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Yep. You gotcha. You look at us. And you see this. This is the Bitcoin hash rate. I mean, yeah, it squiggles a bit. But it, the network is continuing to grow. Global adoption is continuing to move. This is the, you know, the first, you know, ba basically the, the first attempt and then the second attempt post pandemic, uh, you know, it, 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 and then all of a sudden, then we had Luna, ba boom, ba boom. Then we had Celsius and Voyager, ba boom, ba boom. Then we had FTX down here, actually right around here. And then we've been kind of meandering higher. You know, this, it, it, this isn't a, just, this isn't, random you don't see these sorts of things very often when you do if you if you basically shorted this and bought this you know it, it doesn't really matter because this is the one fundamental on bitcoin and we just had last week because so i'm going to say it again two of the top four asset managers in the world not just talk but both said this is a product we want to offer to our customers that is a very big deal and, and, and regardless of whether we have to wait for an end of the Gensler SEC uh, or not, I personally think not. I think that, that that's much too much pressure for the SEC to continue to do something where the courts are effectively going to say your arguments are bullshit. Uh, I don't think they're going to be able to stand up to that. But even without that, if we're talking about long-term adoption, that is a very big deal. And, and, I, and I think that's worth pointing out. So ahead, those are... I completely agreed. And some of the things that you and Alex said are things that I wrote about years ago about when we before we launched Bitto. Um, exactly the cash and carry trade. It's happening completely. This is just the next step of it. Completely agreed again, but it's an if statement. How many people do you know are getting long and leveraged long this space based on that statement? I remember just part of I, sniffing I it nobody, out. I, I hope nobody's getting. Uh, there's a lot. Yeah, I guarantee <laughs> there are a lot. I mean, I guarantee. You, I just see it. I can. That the, the, it's it, what it is. It's the some of the best things I've been doing. You know, being a strategist, you put out your, your views. Is when people give you complete disdain, you know their position. <laughs> and I'm just pointing out facts. I'm like, thank you. I know you're leveraged long now, but here's the key thing I want to point is Bitcoin right now is basically two times the annual volatility of Bitcoin is basically two times that of the NASDAQ. When it first reached the current ratio versus the NASDAQ, about four and change or so, that was six years ago. And it was eight times, almost nine times the volatility. So here's what's happening. Bitcoin is mainstream. Yes, now finally we're going to be able to push a button and it'll be less leverage going in. Your long-term accumulation people are going and buying in. I do fully expect it's going to get to 100,000 eventually. But ask yourself this. Is this going to happen with the tide going out in the equity market, which I expect? Been wrong. Alex, you're right. I've been wrong. But you can't. You got to be careful pointing out your views, your long Bitcoin based on what happened to Bitcoin. What's going to happen to it now? I'm pointing out the facts. Is it's going into the mainstream fastly. It's squashing the volatility. Remember the, the spreads we saw just then? What's the last big vestige of that is, is um, GBTC. I fully still am bullish GBTC because it's going to narrow that spread. But what's happening is all that cash and carry that was in futures that was seeing people saying, oh, you, you didn't get a good leverage and it's still way too expensive to trade in futures. It's getting squashed fast. This ETF is going to just bring it more in the mainstream. And yes, maybe I fully agree with all the big picture stuff that I've been writing about for years, the digital version of gold. Yeah, yeah, get all that stuff. We got to stop saying that because we're long. Let's focus on the more immediate. What's the, the issue here is we are heading towards a recession. Yes, right. Been hearing for long. I get it. Been wrong. But what's happening since it hasn't happened? The Fed's tightening more. We have to expect the yield curve not to matter. You look at 
Fed funds was 30 years. It's the steepest in the, the probability recession from that, from the New York Fed is the highest since 1982. Yes, maybe that stuff doesn't matter. So good luck with that one. But if you ask David Rosenberg, he said the one indication he always watches if he was on a desert island, the only key he'd care about was the yield curve. It's the thing I'd less, I less than I learned trading treasuries in the 80s. You just never fade the yield curve. So here's the key thing I want to ask you. Is, well, it's a if, historic if it, lows here. <laughs> exactly. Sub one percent. So, yeah. But why is that? Because of sessions, it's, it's the lose-lose. Because it hasn't happened as fast as of uh, some of us thought, they <laughs> kept the tightening. If, if, if the stock market was flat in the year, do you think the Fed would still be tightening? Probably not, but it's not. So that's the lose-lose. You're just going to keep doing it. So here's a question I want to end with. I completely agree with that. I'm bullish Bitcoin long term. I think it's going higher, but I think it's more likely to hit to sustain and maybe print below 20 than sustain above 40 if I'm right about the equity market going down and our whole economic scheme is right. The key question I want to ask is, so it's the same ratio right now at about 4.7 versus the NASDAQ. Um, I'm sorry, two, two point. Yeah, it's two. Just double the NASDAQ. Um, and the first trade of that 19 in 2017, and if you look at it, only has popped up big when we had that massive pump in liquidity, and it's come back down. Now we're stuck here. Volatility is declining. It's coming in the mainstream. So I needed to outperform the NASDAQ, and so far it's, yeah, it's kind of on a seven-year basis. If you had bought the NASDAQ seven years ago, you're doing the same thing. And the thing is the difference about being long the NASDAQ. You got AI going for you, and you got the Fed going for you. Because if NASDAQ goes down, typically the Fed will help you. If, the, if Bitcoin goes down, the Fed doesn't care. Nope. Alex, yeah, I see you good. nodding your head. Go ahead. Um, but that's precisely where the opportunity lies. There's, there's a lot of catching up to do. I mean, we're, we're trading in the future, not, not what's happened. So, so right now, Bitcoin, if you think about it from that point of view, it's uh, cheap. Uh, I do want to say that uh, as a trader myself is I have a point where I the risk and uh, it's uh, it may be helpful to know that basically at this point in time, that point is should be very obvious to uh, everybody looking at charts. Bitcoin should not go down to the beginning of this move to where basically the BlackRock news hit. If we go back down to basically 25. 25s. Yeah, low 25s, expect 25 to break and a flash down to go. Uh, it's that's something I would trade. It's uh, if we go down there, I have the risk. It's like I'm, I'm likely wrong. The risk reassess. That being said, I'd be uh, very surprised and levered long right now. And I'd be very surprised if we actually if that happens and risk reward pays to basically stay on uh, press rather than basically take profits or, or even flip. So, so you, yeah, I, I'm long term just to say, leverage? Mike, I mean, just, I mean, I bought, that's it. I mean, I bought not exactly. leverage, but that was my trade of the year was it's going to come back to 25 and I'm going to buy a you bunch know, of Bitcoin. You know, the rule about <laughs> leverage is my, my background's futures and all futures leverage average about 20 to one is the rule about leverage is it usually um, leverage is perfect for removing positions from people who are leveraged and putting them into rightful owners. So I hope you're right. I hope it doesn't go there. I'm just pointing out facts of leverage. And that's, as David pointed out, in facts I've seen with my customers have blown up and I've seen the D's, the deaths and the, and the divorces. <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean, some... just be careful. I yeah. hope you're, I hope you're, I hope we don't get there, but that's what markets do. So what would we do this year in stock market? We proved everybody wrong, including me. But now it's like, okay, well, Gosh, it's went up. It's going to keep going up. But one thing that it's, and that's what I published this morning, the direct correlation between the stock market going up and Fed rate hike pace expectations going up. And the yield curve, yield curve steeping is just to me is a seriously scary pattern that I'm really concerned I have never seen in my life in, in this business. Can, can I ask a question of Alex? So uh, I've had this, and I, I know you linked to or someone linked to the Jason Furman stuff about Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. That to me was fascinating because I'd never seen that before. I'd love to hear about that. My working theory, which sounds tin hat, I realize this is going to sound like cons conspiracy theory, so please, you know, whatever. But my, I've been saying for about a year that when the Fed started tightening, that what they really care about is yield curve management. And then what they really want to do is make the long end much low, keep the long end low and push up the short end to slow Main Street. But help out the government so they can refinance because government debt services is, is becoming we're, we're, we're almost at the point where if if we had a normal yield curve at this point, the government literally couldn't afford to any discretionary spending. They 100 percent of the budget would be on debt service, uh, certainly at seven, eight percent. 
in the long end, which would be a normal yield curve with the short end at four or five, uh, we'd be, you know, the government would be functionally bankrupt and trapped. So I think they've been doing this on purpose. I'm not 100% sure how. And when I see stuff like like this, it makes me think that maybe I am right. And that's a better explanation. But I'm curious what you think. Real quick. So, Dave, to be clear, you're basically calling this yield curve control. Well, what Japan has been doing for, yes. for, for forever. Just for everyone. Just, like, you know, it's, I think, look, the fact of the matter is everyone knows Japan's doing it. And the market, of course, when you know that's happening, the market adjusts. And I don't think that the Fed is. I think they're trying to be more subtle about it. But it's certainly yeah. what they want. I yeah. mean, I'm, not, I'm just not sure how they're doing it. Sorry, I mean, go ahead, Alex. I know he, he asked yeah. you. I just want to be clear so people understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, uh, first, uh, I'd like to add on, on the yield curve that was shared before. Basically, I think it was a 10 and 2s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, uh, the, the yield curve is something important to understand that uh, the yield curve is not the cause, it's a consequence of the Fed's fight, is the, the fastest and most aggressive tightening in history. And uh, furthermore, we are, we are too focused for good reason and bad reason at the same time. We're too focused on the U.S. sometimes. The, uh, that, the sample size of uh, yield curve inversions is very low. It's a small sample size. And if you broaden the sample size and then you start going abroad and you go to emerging markets, for example, you're going to notice that the curve does invert all across the curve multiple times through history without recessions and they do not precede recessions. So I actually contest the importance of the yield curve predicting recessions. I think it's actually, I think this time it may likely be different or it, it's, uh, let's put it this way, may not be different, but uh, it's also a matter of how big the recession is. Just another recession is not enough for, for markets to crash. We need a hard landing. We need a very bad recession. We need We need data to start printing really bad surprise into the downside. Uh, we need a core CPI to basically not just continue going down or, or, or flip here and there. We need core CPI inflation to come in extremely hot. Uh, we need PMI readings to come in the 30s. Um, that's, that, that's on the yield curve. And, and basically for markets to go down, we need what, what uh, I call an information shock. It has to be something new. If you think about it, if we think about basically what happened in 2022, the push down, it all happened really fast. Bitcoin was faster, but but markets basically, uh, we started getting, uh, the market started getting bearish on the inflation reading uh, uh, of uh, uh, November 2011. Uh, things got serious, like the Fed told us, okay, we're going to screw this market in uh, in the FOMC. On, it, it, became, it became clear on the minutes of uh, January 2023, that was the 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 wow day. It's like sh shit getting serious, uh, and then they got extremely aggressive at the end of uh, at the end of March, like March 28th, March 31st. That's that's when they got really aggressive, and the whole move literally happened two and a half months. Uh, um, most risk assets. If we let, let's assume that the UK didn't happen on the October uh, UK. Uh, a blow up the, uh, to put it in a way it didn't happen it's it, for most risk assets the bottom was in in june uh that that cpi reading which was a very very it was an it was a surprise a cpi reading i think it was june 11th uh on 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 a friday uh the week after we bottomed um so um yeah so 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 that on on what you were saying uh uh dave about uh governments trying to engineer this um, I, I, I understand the thesis. Uh, it may be right. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's more of a conspiracy theory that people like to talk about it. And, As uh, I said, I, 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 have I no don't buy it. About it. <laughs> So, uh, but so I, I, I understand it. I respect the view. So oh, I, I don't know that I have the view. What no. I have is, 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 is data. And the data says that's what they want. That's what's happened. And I can't understand why it would be different. I, 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 and I noticed you backtracked. I find it amusing. Every smart trader that I know knows that the, the, the easiest way to go bankrupt is to say this time is different. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here, here's what I want to follow up with a very profound statement. 
And that is, I think most risk assets, cryptos and stock markets are going to go down in 2H because they went up in 1H. Bottom line, that's it. Um, it's going to be tough. But the thing is, think of the reiterations. If we're sitting here in December and say the Nasdaq's down 10%, what's that going to feel like? What's we're going to think? And that's going to be a true recession. What's the Fed going to be doing? And then this is where we just disagree, Alex. I completely respect your view that re yield curve doesn't matter. My view is it matters more than ever. And I think the U.S. matters more than ever. And I have to ask yourself is why is virtually every central bank on the planet scrambling to catch up to the Fed? Because the Fed matters more than ever now. Um, except for one made country, China. Why are they easing or trying? And all the narrative I hear is, oh, they got to uh, add stimulus. And why? Because um, they are falling behind. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I think what? that... Sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, please. No, please. I, I was going to say, I think that it's very... It's, it's fascinating. You know, being contrarian generally pays off. Uh, we all understand that, but I think that there are a couple of questions that are the ones the, the, the ones that underlie the reason why there's a consensus is the the thing that that ha troubles me. I mean, we know there's a gaping, literally a gaping hole in the balance sheets of the of all of the non systematically important banks in commercial real estate, and it's a gaping hole that's because of a uh, secular change, not a cyclical change. I mean, banks can weather cyclical changes easily, but those 50% open offices are, are, are in the major cities. They're not coming back. Those, you know, those at, at a minimum, even if we don't end up with, with full-time remote workers, et cetera, we're going to have more geographically dispersed workers because people realize that the need to congregate in the same hugely expensive area is going to decrease. I mean, we know this. This is like there's no question about it. We know generative AI is a very big deal. But what people don't talk about is how many companies are going to get disrupted and how many people are going to get thrown out of work because of generative AI. And we are absolutely not not positioned at all to handle that. Now, those two cross currents are interesting. One is extremely bullish. One is extremely bearish. The bearish one is obviously commercial real estate. The bullish one, why am I being bullish? Well, it's not good for humanity. It's not good for all the people who get thrown out of work. But there is zero probability of, an common, of, of a restrictive Federal Reserve and restrictive fiscal policy if people are starting to get thrown out of work. That's just not going to happen. But Alex's point, which I find, which I, which I find persuasive, is we've not seen you know, even workforce participation, we have not seen anything close to the misery index of the 70s yet. For the thesis, for the bear thesis to be right, we have to be before the it recession. It hasn't even pivoted yet. It hasn't even turned yet. <laughs> right. So, you know, we, we, we still see happy. unemployment long term below trend. And, and, and even if you play with the workforce participation numbers, it's still below trend, just not as much. And to me, I don't that's know what those numbers are now, but you're talking about misery index. I think people are doing exceptionally well, and that's the story that's not being told. <laughs> well, right, but that's my point. My point is, <laughs> look, I, I remember the 70s barely. I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> I was in, in high school. Uh, and I remember, you know, uh, what getting in line for gas was and inflation in double digits. And I was at school and taking and learning economics, you know, right when, inflate, when Volcker tightened. So I was there during that. And, and we don't have conditions even remotely like that. It, they're not even remotely the same. They are unprecedented, but they're unprecedented from a crazy low level. And, and I'll leave you with this one other thought is in Volcker's case, and I've said this before on the show, but it was a while ago, so it bears repeating. In Volcker's case, we went from uh, effectively re interest rate, real interest rates of zero to slightly positive to 6% positive, 6 i.e. interest rates 6% higher than inflation. We're still negative in real interest rates today. So we have had the greatest increase in, 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 in history, yada, yada, yada. We're still fucking negative. And at the end of the day, inflation is still higher than interest rates in, 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 in pretty much any way you measure it. At a bare minimum, it's not 6% negative interest rates where interest rates are much high, positive, where interest rates are way higher than inflation. So one could make the argument that if the Fed really wanted to shock and awe uh, and they really wanted to cause a recession, that what they would have had to have done is raise interest rates even higher because we were so low for so long and so dumb that it's kind of hard to argue. But the fact is, if you just forget the velocity of where we got to, and that's why I was so interested in those tweets that Alex shared in, in, in our private conversation from, is that 
the vol Mike's right on the velocity, 100% sure. But on the absolute level, totally wrong. It's not not only not unprecedented; it's not even really all that restrictive. So if you just dry, if you just parachute in today and had no idea of history and said, "Okay, we are interest rates versus inflation," you would say meh. And if you parachuted in and said, "Let's ignore the excuse me the last two years," and where are interest rates versus long term historical average, you would also say meh. So it's extremely important to put everything in context. But a hundred percent, Mike is a hundred percent right. That that well, I mean, my favorite quote, Mike, you you use, and I used it last last week, is the Fed is driving, looking at the rearview mirror, right? Yeah. You know, as opposed to you looking at leading indicators, and I think that's true too. So there's all sorts of cross currents. So that's why, I, but but I'm curious, you know, Alex, what you think about that because it's really about perspective, right? And w what time horizon you're looking at, and what you're or what you're seeing. Yeah, well, I think it's important to point out that the inflation that you're you're entirely right on 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 the Fed rates and interest and, and inflation. But uh, that being said, inflation uh, is dropping consistently, and it will continue dropping consistently. And a way to think about it is even with the Fed not hiking next year, we're gonna see as inflation drops down due to base effects and lag the effects of the Fed's policies we're still going to see a tightening of about 2% as inflation goes down. So it doesn't really matter that, that interest rate, that real rates right now are not that restrictive. The point is that they soon will be. So it, 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 it becomes a mute point. Uh, the, the economy is tightening. And on back to the first point you were saying, I think is very important is commercial real estate Actually, I think we talked about this uh, uh, when uh, I may have been in, in February and on uh, the last time we were together uh, on, on this podcast. That uh, the, I think the way to think about this is that it's a very high probability that commercial real estate sees a big crush. The question is, how does this spread to the banking system? Uh, if it spreads and we start seeing a few banks going down, we're going to see panic again. Now, the thing is, because of the trend, because of the chart and because of positioning, that would be your buy the fucking dip, BTF, the moment for many of us uh, that have basically spare capital to allocate. So uh, it's, it's just a matter of the chart and positioning. So it's, it's, we should be actually not that fearful of that happening. And uh, on, on to the third point that you mentioned on AI, uh, I do want to stress that this thing, uh, I think it's impossible to predict how, how big it's going to be. That's the thing. We can't even fathom. So if we can't fathom it, what is the probability that the markets and, that, and we are able to price it in accordingly so fast? It's zero. We can't. So that being said, AI is a thing, and at the same time, and finally, on the, to, to, to wrap it up here, is this AI bubble has just started. It's tiny. We're at the very beginning with the Fed basically pausing soon, eventually, say they pause in uh, December, and they pivot. I mean, pivoting would make sense uh, on a historical <laughs> basis based on their own forecasts. Uh, sometime in, in the first half on, of uh, 2024, based basically on the FED's, um, without putting uh, uh, our views, based on the FED's own projections of unemployment and CPI, it would make sense for the FED to start uh, cutting rates and, and basically pivoting sometime in the first half of the next year. I so think the big question the there, Fed, then, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was no, please, the go big ahead. question is, is, why does the FED pivot if the stock market doesn't crash? Exactly. That's the problem. I mean, that's obviously uh, a few. I, I, I agree so with crash. the data that you're saying. Yeah, but, Alex, so, I agree with you on the data. I just think something, maybe it's unemployment goes up high enough. I don't know. But I just don't see them pivoting without stocks crashing that's hard. The, that, that's the problem. We're at a stage now that's something that's really never happened um, in modern history, normal history. Is I look at it, you're sitting at the Fed and you read all their statements and read what they say. Is They're worried about core PC, personal consumption expenditure, which is 4.62%. Their target's 2 um, and for me, I look at it as there is actually no incentive for them until something makes them, something breaks, and obviously nothing's really significant broke, the number one thing to break, to make them stop tightening. I didn't say ease yet. There's no reason for them to ease. 
everything's perfect. Inflation's going down for them. Economy's fully employed. Why take the risk of tilting of what I think they're going to go back in history of being what Irving Fisher said? Irving Fisher, the famous economist, said we've reached a new higher plateau in 1929. That's going to think what's happening. So we, I, this is uh, this is how historic it is. But the key thing I want to point out is. What did you fully expect? Some of us fully expect in this environment is people to say, oh, inflation is going down. It's great. It's not just going down. The producer PPI core at minus nine tenths next month is going to be much lower is dropping its fastest pace in ever in history since 1948. So why is that? Why did it go up? And that's the key thing I look at. I have a chart in front of me just looking at personal consumption expenditures. It went up for one reason because we pumped the most liquidity in the system ever. And now we're taking it away. Just look at money supply. Money supply didn't matter. I remember trading in the pits in the 80s and we stopped looking at money supply because it didn't matter. But when it goes up the most and it goes down the most, that's what, what matters. And I just read this book recently. I knew it was facts, but called Booms and Busts. And all the biggest booms and busts in history have come back on the back of liquidity that goes away. That's what this is. We're still in the liquidity going away, yet the market doesn't believe it. The stock market does. Now, the bond market does. The yield curve does. The commodity market doesn't believe it. It does believe it. Cryptos believe it. And I look at the opportunity here is um, for next half is that the big money is going to be made not in leveraged long because we already made tons of money in leveraged long. The opportunity is I look at it as structuring positions in these risk assets going back down. Because if they do go down, look at the iterations. They have to stay elevated. I'd look at crude oil. I don't see crude oil going up unless the stock market keeps going up. And if the stock market is down, it's going to crash. What's going to make it go up other than a war? Uh, Anyone on, have an on answer? Le on, go ahead, on Alex. Leverage, uh, leverage on the, on the Bitcoin side hasn't gone up that much. Uh, that that's something I want to stress since uh, the black actually news, which yeah, but Alex, just to say it was actually open interest was completely wiped on both sides over the weekend exactly. and on that move on Friday. So it's actually very, very low at the moment if we're looking at retail traders. That's retail exactly level. what I wanted to point out. The open yeah. interest on Bitcoin is almost at the same level as it was on an aggregate basis. At the, as, a, as it was at the very beginning of this move. So on the future side, there's not much leverage. There's no, no, no additional, there's always much leverage, right? <laughs> but there's, there's not, not much additional leverage. Uh, there's been a lot of leverage put on, on, on the option side by institutional players. That happened. But at the same time, uh, that just started happening. It's, it's, a, it's a, I think we're seeing, a, we're at the beginning of a, reg a regime change on Bitcoin volatility, basically, uh, players have spent an entire half a year selling upside ball non-stop, uh, literally making uh, implied Bitcoin implied volatility drop down to historical levels. So when when the move after such a long period and a long regime of vol volatility selling, and suddenly the market changes, it doesn't adjust that fast. We it, it, it from a from a risk taking perspective, it pays off and makes sense to keep on betting on more upside for that break. Um, yeah, that. Ja, Mike, just for clarity, do you think that we're talking past each other a bit because he and I are talking about leverage mostly on perpetual swaps and retail exchanges, and maybe you're talking about it institutionally? I haven't really no. looked at CME. I, 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 it made me look at it. I really appreciate you bringing that out. I have a colleague who's based in Sydney who looks more on chain day that you watch more closely. The CME open interest is right about the all time high. It's fully expected. It's, there's a bull market. And that's one thing I really like, enjoyed pointing out last year when everybody was bullish commodities and open interest was going down. And the, Bitcoin is going down, but open interest is going up. Mike, well, that's not going to last. And Bitcoin bounced and commodities went down. Now the point is we've had that bounce. We've bounced 100% from the lows. And now everybody's bullish. And the fundamentals might be tilting the other way. I look at it as, okay, buy low, sell high. <laughs> but as far as that, the key thing I think with the smart people doing, Alex, you're involved in this, is probably buying dips, adding longs in Bitcoin, and selling anything else. I mean, look what happened on Friday. We saw that little move in Bitcoin, and then we, we lifted some of those shorts and uh, some of those uh, positions in the alts. I, I see this is the IRS is coming after you. <laughs> I mean, it's serious. We know this. I remember seeing this in the trading pits. I had a brother who wasn't paying his taxes. They went to his account and cleared it out. You think there's people in cryptos all paying their taxes? I mean, Kraken was crap. Uh, they're, they're going down to crap and uh, cracking today. I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to find out that a lot of the people who weren't 
paying taxes, all that information is going to be coming out. It's just logical. I mean, I've seen it so much when you can kind of get away with it for a short term and greed comes in there. So then I look at this 25,000 of them. That's massive purging, still way overdue in the broad space. Bitcoin's going to come out ahead, but the whole thing might go lower, just Bitcoin going less. It's just the key thing you have to ask yourselves. If, if I'm long cryptos or long Bitcoin now, what's my position? What's my view on the stock market for the second half? If you're bearish the stock market and you expect that divergence, I like, yeah, good luck. Maybe, hopefully that'll happen. I've been hoping and waiting for that forever. And I still see, man, it's still trading like leveraged stock market. And that's the way I look at it. Except the rest of the space is trading like the, the like more sellers on every rally. Versus I mean, I, I'd like to know where, I mean, I guess if they're going back to 2020 and 2021 taxes, that's fine. But, you know, unless you were leveraged short, which U.S. investors aren't legally allowed to do anyway, I mean, who the hell made money in the United States in 2022 in crypto? That's what I say all the time. I'm like, uh, yeah, there's crypto, wealthy crypto investors Biden keeps talking about. <laughs> like, uh, go find me those guys at this point. But, but my, I think I tend to agree. Listen, I know we got to go, but I want Alex's opinion on one other thing, which you just hinted at, Mike. Okay, let's say Mike's completely correct about stock market. It's going to crash. The Fed continues to tighten. Can Bitcoin come out ahead in that environment? So okay. that's where we always get stuck here. So I would love Alex's view since everybody else's is somewhat known. Uh, my, I hate to say it, but this time is different. I'm betting on that. <laughs> So you, you yeah. think we could go into a legitimate recession even worse and Bitcoin could perform well as a hedge against that? Not a very bad recession. Uh, I'm okay. just a, a, a small like 2001 like recession, you know, the mild one. I think it's fine because Bitcoin right now still has the ETF story to play out. That That's the point. It's enough for it to do its own thing for a while. Again, uh, I, I do want to stress people get very concerned about, but is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? And the answer is, we don't know. But it doesn't yeah. matter because it's not yet priced in, likely yeah. so. So I we can still keep because, on running. Yeah, it's so tenuous. We saw that a uh, sort of misleading headline on Friday dropped Bitcoin $1,000 just at the hint of the idea that the SEC might not be ready to approve. So I 100% I, I agree with you that it's a tailwind. I just think it's important. We well, just saw that very quick evidence of how quickly that can change, even with a headline, right? I think what, what Dave, what you brought out of that, and what Dave brought in the Twitter spaces you did with Rand, too, was perfect. That was ideal. I remember I read it. I listened to it on my bike ride home. Like you guys nailed it. Like, it's actually a good sign. They're asking for more information. I'm like, yeah, thank yeah. you for that. I, and, yeah. and that to me is coming out. But yeah, it's just okay. When? <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah, uh, we, we're going to need more. The, the, the hype of the ETF will fade, right? We're gonna, we'll need a new narrative to, to push, you know, to 40,000 or something. We'll have to see an approval or, or something else. But no, I don't think so, Scott. I think for 40, for to reverse 2022 requires, uh, because that's really all we're talking about, is literally right. reversing Luna and whatnot. It's going to require a lot of things. The most bullish, I mean, we've had, Two hugely bullish stories. We talked about one, but the other one that's massively bullish that no one's talking about, it didn't move the market at all, is what's going on in the UK. Uh, the fact that they now have a, a parliamentary agreed signed into law framework. Okay. For, for <laughs> well, it's not just that, but the point is people have said, well, Micah is ahead and the UK is behind and they don't want to do this. The UK is a prime minister that we would salivate over if it was in the U.S. If Rishi Sunak's policy were in the United States, crypto, Bitcoin would be trading over 100,000 right now. He is massively pro-digital assets and crypto and wants to set London up to be that. He has been stating that from the beginning. And people wonder why the FCA dragging their heels. Well, the answer is they didn't have a legal framework for it. Now they do. And nobody's talking about that, which is, yeah. to me, you know, I, I tend to line up with Alex. I like bull markets that climb a wall of worry. Obviously, there's a wall of worry here. And to me, that's another map. I mean, these are very big deals. And we'll talk about them more in the Twitter spaces. But I, I would love to hear from some of the other people who are outside the U.S. But I think that's a big deal. I mean, London has always been one of the world's biggest financial centers. And the fact is, is there are a lot of companies that have and a lot of money that's still sitting there. And post-Brexit world could be a big deal. So I think that's another story that we haven't talked about, but is important and probably should be mentioned. Okay, yeah, so there's a chance. 
So you're saying there's a chance and dumb and dumber, right? So what was all that one in a million talk? <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. And, and, and speaking of erasing 2022, uh, Dave, I know you're joining. Both you guys are welcome if you want to. But uh, in 10 minutes, we got the three Arrows Capital guys on Twitter Spaces. And I'm not I'm sure that they've done that. many. I, I, I don't want, really want to interact too much with, with until. You, know, you can just sit on the. I, 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 you know, this is they're, they're more friendly with Rand. So I've told him, like, you lead because they know. Uh, I think my opinion has been somewhat clear and maybe I'm not the guy to take the, the front on that interview. <laughs> the question to ask is, 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 is the one that's going to make your blood boil the most is to publicly say, you know, who, who made the phone call? Did Ehrlich make the phone call? That's, I, that's no, it. I asked him, did I, I've told you this story, right? Yeah. Uh, really quick before we go, I'm sorry to keep you guys, but I met, I crashed a meeting with Kyle and in Dubai in February. You know, I was not invited and I just sat down. He gave me the, oh shit eyes. And I said, dude, what lie did you tell Steve Ehrlich to get him to give you $700 million of Voyager's money? And he said, Scott, I know you don't like me, but I swear to you on my mother, on everything that is holy, all these guys were so desperate for yield. They called us. They offered us unsecured loans. They didn't even ask for a PDF of our balance sheet. They just said, three O's capital. You guys are amazing. You guys are making money. We need yield. Here's the money. He swears by it. So, wow. I, and you know what? As much as I dislike him, I tend to believe it based on what we've seen in the past. That hunt for yield. I, I don't have, I don't doubt it. Yeah. One thing you do, okay. guys, you bring out great educational information. I really appreciate what you do. <laughs> We're trying. Sure, you Alex, dude, really. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, you're welcome back anytime, man. This was really great. Uh, thank you. And, and I appreciate everybody listening to one another. Uh, I guess, well, I don't know about tomorrow. Tomorrow I will not be here. But, uh, guys, see you on Twitter Spaces in about 15 minutes. Thanks, gentlemen. Bye. Guys, uh, um, can yeah, I say something quickly? Uh, basically, I wanted to share I'm launching with two partners, a macro advisory firm. I didn't know uh, that. Basically, awesome. uh, today. Yeah, it's basically today. Uh, the name is Asgard Markets, and uh, we'll like be uh, <laughs> talking about it uh, a lot in, in, in the coming future. Where can people check? The, have you tweeted about it or uh, anything? Uh, not, so, yet. not yet. Okay. It's, it's happening today. Right here first. Happening, happening, happening very soon. Okay, yeah. awesome. We'll, we'll check that and just send me the tweet. We'll retweet it and everything. That's awesome. Lot. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. That's dope.